Hey, I was asked tonight to talk about Pico balloons, and uh, you know, it it kind of falls into. First of all, I'll introduce myself and give you some stats on me here in a minute, but uh, uh, and then I'll mention this a little bit more toward the end of my talk tonight. But we we have a ham radio show called Amateur Radio Roundtable, and it's a, a weekly show. It's been going now close to seven years, and we've got great co-hosts, and we have guests from around the world, and um, we. Uh, we have different things going on, and we've been having a project going called Pico Balloons. Uh, and I know some of you guys are going to be probably launching one here soon. So we want to talk a little about Pico, and then I'll, I'll close it off and tell you a little bit more about the show. And I think we've got some interesting things that many of your members uh, might be you know, interested in, in joining us. So let me, uh, let me kick it off here. So tonight I'm going to talk about... Um, I'm going to talk about ham radio going around the world at 45,000 feet. And uh, by the way, we just launched a new Pico balloon this afternoon at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Um, it's already reached uh, 42,500 feet, and that's the altitude that it's going to fly. And we hope it's up for uh, six, seven, eight, nine months. Uh, we're not sure uh, how long it's going to stay up. But um, last I looked at it, we were doing 132 miles per hour, and we were over uh, Atlanta. So we're heading your way. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's me. Uh, I'm an uh, extra class ham. Been licensed since 1964. Uh, not an old timer like some of you guys, but uh, I, it feels like it's been a long time. But I can remember my first contact and. Ham radio has been great to me uh, over all these years, and uh, it's just amazing at all the things that you can do in ham radio and, and stay interested in it. I've got a general radio telephone operator license uh, with radar endorsement. That was the old first class license, uh, many of you may uh, know. Uh, I'm a senior member of the IEEE and, of course, host of the popular uh, video podcast called Amateur Radio Roundtable. So uh, let's see. Let's talk a little about what's going to go. Uh, what, what we're going to talk about tonight? Pico ballooning. I wrote an article in CQ magazine uh, last month, and so some of you guys, if you take CQ, you probably have already heard a lot of things I'm going to talk about. But uh, we were in the October uh, magazine of uh, CQ, so uh, you know, dig it out and and look it up. And uh, if you need to uh, refresh yourself on anything here. So, what is a Pico balloon? It's not a weather balloon. You know, weather balloons are real stretchy, big things. Uh, you put a lot of gas in them. They go up real high. Uh, they, they pop and they come back down. And that's how they're made to do it. They'll, they'll go up and uh, they'll burst and, and fall. Uh, our balloons are made not to burst. Well, well, well let, me take, let me go back. Our balloons, we engineer our balloons not to burst. In other words, we know the cubic feet uh, inside the balloon. Uh, we know the weight of the uh, uh, payload we're going to send up with it. Uh, we know the lift of the certain gas, whether we use hydrogen or helium or, or whatever. And everything's calculated down to the gram. And uh, we'll put just the right amount of gas, lift gas, in it that we can fly these balloons at, say, 42,000 or 45,000 feet, and they will stay at that altitude uh, from that point forward. Uh, the one today is flying at 42, it, it hadn't quite reached its maximum altitude yet, but it's flying at 42,125 feet uh, to tonight. We're solar powered only, if you look at this little diagram here, you see the balloon at the top, and you notice it doesn't look like it's filled up very much. In fact, uh, our balloons, when we launch them, they look almost empty. And that's because as gas expands, every 18,000 feet, the gas will double itself in volume. So um, we got to be careful there. We don't want it to expand larger than the balloon can hold, or it will burst and it will come down. So our typical configuration, that, like we're flying today, is the balloon, of course. Uh, and then we have a little tracker that we build. We're building our own tracker, and it's located uh, at the end of a string there at about uh, 17 feet below. Now why is it 17 feet below? Well, we're using 20 meter whisper uh, as the um, communications uh, for this balloon. And we're flying a 20 meter dipole. 
a 20 meter vertical dipole. So half that antenna runs from the tracker up to the balloon and the other half of the antenna hangs below the balloon. Now, probably many of you guys know what number 36 wire is. It's, it's about the size of a hair on your head. You can't hardly see it, man. That is what the antenna is made out of. The entire 20 meter antenna weighs 1.6 grams. And that includes the string that goes from the tracker up to the balloon. 1.6 grams. A penny, a U.S. penny, weighs 2.5 grams. So we've got a full 20 meter vertical dipole antenna that weighs 1.6 grams. Then, of course, we've got solar cells on there to give us power. And we are uh, running uh, solar cell only. We're not running batteries on these flights. Um, the um, solar cells uh, give us enough current, but but there's there's a problem there. We can only transmit during sunlight. So anytime we're in the dark, we're not gonna we're not gonna be transmitting. So only during uh, daylight hours. Now you may ask, why don't you put a battery on it? Well, first of all, batteries are very heavy, and uh, also second thing is a battery won't work at forty five thousand feet. Uh, a rechargeable battery won't work up there. We're talking about temperatures of minus uh, 40 degrees Celsius, which is about 90, uh, minus 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I have a video that we put together here uh, in our lab, and we show that uh, uh, we try to charge one of the little LiPo batteries, and we discharge the LiPo battery, and we bring it down. We bring the temperature down to minus 40 degrees, and the battery just turns off just like it's not there. It won't charge, it won't output. So we don't run batteries uh, at all on these things. But we got some great coverage with solar cells uh, during during uh, the, the, the daylight hours. Of course, winter, we have less daylight. But uh, we tried something new this time. We tried a different configuration of our solar cells. Normally, we fly a flat panel pointing up. But, you know, winter, the sun's low. And... Um, if the sun, uh, if the sun angle on the solar panels is not greater than 20 degrees, you don't get any voltage. Well, we're flying one today. The cells are tilted down, and we actually had uh, maximum voltage from from sunrise till sunset. In fact, we actually transmitted to three degrees below uh, sunset tonight. So that was really exciting. We've never done that before. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Oh, and I just threw a bunch of slides. Man, I've got, this is such an exciting thing for me to talk about. I, I've got hundreds and thousands of pictures here, and uh, I just grabbed a bunch just to give you guys kind of an update of, uh, uh, and, and kind of an insight to what, what we're doing here. Hey, here's a balloon. This is my friend Ed, Ed Harrison here, and this is a, a typical launch. This looked exactly like the launch today. That is an SBS-13 balloon. Uh, you can fly. There, there's only a few balloons that are capable of flying in, in this, this uh, float uh, Pico balloon type environment. There's some very inexpensive $4 uh, Chinese clear balloons that we can fly. They'll last maybe a week, uh, a week, week and a half, two weeks. Some people have flown them a lot longer, but typically they don't last that long. Uh, and... Um, they fly at much lower altitudes. They won't fly much higher than about 37, 38,000 feet. This particular balloon here is one that we fly on all of our flights. This is called an SBS-13. It's the only other option. It's made out of a material that actually they use nowadays to wrap sushi with. It's to keep the freshness in. So this is a sushi wrap balloon, basically. And, and, and that is a, um, that membrane there will hold the hydrogen or helium inside where another balloon won't do it. And I know you have seen and bought these party balloons and take it home, you know, to your kids and, you know, the balloons float and then the next day they're on the floor. Well, um, our, our last good flight went 72 days and it went three and a half times around the earth. You can see just a little bubble in the end because that balloon is going to expand as it goes up. Every 18,000 feet, that's going to double. So uh, that was a that's a launch there. We we need calm with that that balloon there. We need calm weather to launch. We had 11 mile an hour winds today, so we needed a long runway. And uh, uh, I think after after probably um, 
maybe a few thousand feet. We were still only up about 340 feet after about 3,000 feet. But it finally made, it finally hit the altitude and went on up. Um, there's a, a, a number of different commercial trackers out there available. This is one by Q, uh, QRP Labs. It's a typical setup. You can see the solar panel is, is, uh, is uh, soldered on the side there. And there's some super capacitors in there. The super capacitors are there to help steady the voltage. And um, uh, for instance, that thing's going to be kind of moving around a little bit in the air, you know. And if that solar panel uh, gets out of the sun for a second, typically your voltage would go off. So that's those super capacitors there will actually hold the voltage and the current there. Uh, on our flight today, uh, they will actually run the tracker for two minutes. Even if you turn the sun off, it would still run for two minutes on just the super trackers. So that's a typical one by QRP Labs right there. Uh, here's Bill Brown. Uh, Bill Brown has got a great tracker. It's, he called it the uh, Sky Tracker. You can see two uh, solar panels on each side, and that's his tracker. Um, and uh, the QRP tracker, it's, it's probably, a, it's a little over $100. I think Bill's is probably $150, $160. Uh, but it's already assembled, and Bill provides you a balloon. He provides you, he, he puts the code in. He puts your call in. He does everything. It's ready to fly. Uh, here's it, it, the left picture there is that QRP tracker that I showed you a few minutes ago. And if you look to, on my, uh, uh, in the right picture, that's the tracker I'm flying. That's the tracker I'm building right now. Uh, it is, uh, uh, that, that entire tracker only weighs 1.5 grams. That is lighter than a 1.6 gram antenna. So if you look at that tracker in my hand there, it's got a GPS system on it. It's got a computer processor on it. It's got a transmitter on it. And uh, all that, in that one little thing in my hand there, 1.5 grams. Now, I have to build that under a microscope. Uh, the parts are so small, you just can't see them. And if you drop one, don't think about trying to pick it up. You're not going to find it. So there's a, there's a tracker that I, I'm flying right now on the left. There's Bill Brown's tracker uh, on the right there, his sky tracker. His sky tracker is a great, uh, great tracker. So there it is again. You can see it. Um, the wires on there actually weigh almost as much as the tracker. So we don't use those wires. But just for testing, uh, I would. Uh, uh, I had some wires on there to, to hook the antenna up and also to hook power up. You know, we had a uh, we had a thing going with our show, our weekly show, that we were going to get a balloon around the world if it took launching one every week. And, uh, of course, it could get expensive, you know, $160 balloon, $150 tracker, you know, talking, you know, 300 bucks a launch, not counting gas and stuff like that. So uh, uh, we had a commitment on our show that we were going to get a balloon around the world. And we have actually been flying a balloon solid for the past 12 months for the show. We, I, I uh, uh, decided that we were going to build our own tracker. That's the little boards I had made right there. Uh, I can build that little tracker for about 40 bucks, where if I bought one, it would cost me 150 So it saves us a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's the tracker uh, we, uh, we're, we're running right there. Uh, here, here's a part. I want you to look at this really closely. I don't know how good the connection is there, but if you look at the end of the tweezers, you can see that is a resistor. That's a resistor on there, and I, I magnified it down at the bottom. Those are 0402 uh, surface mount capacitors and resistors. And uh, uh, I actually, uh, I built it under a microscope. That tweezer will hold it. It, it takes the smallest soldering iron you can find, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty tedious. I started building these things, um, and uh, they were so difficult, I said it can't be done. And I quit, I think, six times, but I kept staying with it. And I finally mastered it, and I can build them now. So there, there's another uh, another shot of that that capacitor. See, that is a sewing needle that you see there. It's not a baseball bat, but that's a sewing needle. And if you look right at the end of that sewing needle, that is like a a .01 uh, uh, cap. So you can see the size there, and you can see, like I mentioned, if you drop one on the on the workbench, just don't even look for it. Just get another one. 
There's a comparison of the tracker I build with a postage stamp. That's one of the solar cells below it. Uh, a friend of mine in Romania actually designed the tracker board, uh, uh, Edward Y03ICT. Now, I want you to look at this picture in the left here. That is the tracker that I'm building. Plus, he has six solar cells on it. Plus, you see the little antenna sticking up there. That's the GPS antenna. His entire tracker, plus all the solar cells, weighs 3.9 grams. That's less than the weight of a nickel. And, and it's important to keep, uh, keep the uh, weight down. And there's a comparison of it uh, next to uh, a battery there. Um, the, the, the schematics, it, it, this is pretty washed out, but the schematic is pretty simple. There's three main parts, a transmitter, a GPS, and a processor. There's only about 11 or 12 total parts on that board, but uh, it is a doozy to, uh, to build. Um, now, we don't want to go off starting World War III, because when we let this balloon go, you don't know where it's going to go. We fly over Iraq, we fly over Iran, uh, we fly over a lot of places, and uh, we don't want to start World War III. Now, so there's a thing, and, and there, there are some laws where we can't fly, we can't transmit over certain countries. We can't transmit over the UK, or Yemen, uh, or uh, North Korea, and I've got little boxes there. So what we do in our software, in this tracker, is we do what we call geofencing. And we tell that tracker, if I'm in this part of the world, based on my GPS, don't transmit. So that's how we uh, don't start a war right there. Uh, you know, I was going to mention at the beginning of the, the, the thing here to keep, keep you guys interested that we were going to talk about astronauts and ants tonight. You know, the ant, an ant, the little ant bug that crawls, you know, ant, ant, astronauts and ants. So... I'll get to the ant. I'll get to the ants in a minute, and uh, you'll be surprised about the ants. My friend, astronaut Doug Wheelock, and, and I met him through Ham Radio. Ham Radio is great, man. And this is uh, me and my friend Doug Wheelock, astronaut Doug Wheelock, at Dayton uh, last, well, the year before last, but the last one ahead, you know. And um, this is a, a balloon launch that, that Bill Brown does up there every year. It's kind of like a balloon race. And different people launched their, you know, we had four balloons, I think, uh, uh, the Dayton Amateur Radio Club launched three, and I launched one, or Doug, I had Doug launch one. It was a race. So I thought, what's the best way to really be successful in getting this balloon in this race and winning is to get an astronaut to launch it for you. So I took Doug outside, and we launched. And, and poor Doug, I mean, astronaut, I mean, he's a master at everything. He crashed it twice. Everybody else has took off, but I'm gonna, here's a, just a short one here. Uh, we'll show you what it looks like to launch one. So there goes one. That's just a little silver party balloon. Uh, that's one of the cheap $4 balloons that can fly. All right, so that was one of them. It took off fine. The second, and well, we had some terrible wind. If you look at that, the wind was just tearing those balloons to pieces. Again, those balloons are not very full. You can kind of tell by looking at how empty they are. There goes the second one there. Bill, t Bill told uh, astronaut Wheelock, you got to run with it. Well, he's an astronaut. I, I, I just said astronauts don't run, man. Yeah. So, and here we go. We're fixing a lot here, Doug. And that wind is just really bad. So Doug is fixing a lot here. Here's his first attempt. And uh, these have helium in it. And we're flying a, a, a sky tracker from, uh, from Bill Brown. So there, here he goes. It, uh, it looks pretty good. Looks like it's pretty good. It's, it's got some lift. Uh oh, it took a kamikaze dive right there and it wrapped around an RV mirror. So we went and got the thing and we're going to do launch number two. So he, 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 here he is. Astronaut we like. He says, Man, Tom, I feel like I let you down. Man, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I said, not, not a problem, not a problem. We're just, we'll launch again. You know, launch again. So here we go. So Doug's going to launch it again. He's getting back uh, to uh, the launch position here, and he's going to let it go. And uh, this is uh, this is kind of interesting. I thought we lost it for good on this one, but here he goes. He's uh, he's uh, he's fixing a lot here. <laughs> I 
I think Bill said you got to run with it. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't like to hear that, I don't think. Okay, here we go. All right. Here we go. All right, here we go. All right, so yeah, it's kind of low. It's, is it going to go up? It's going up a little, going up. You look at Doug, he's saying up, 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 up. And he says, oh, no, it wrapped around a power line. So <laughs> it wrapped around a power line. But then it unwrapped and it took off. So that's what, uh, that's what you get for, you know, I guess these astronauts don't really train that much in launching balloons like this. We, we'll have to teach you. Our first launch was a single 36-inch Mylar balloon. That's Bill Brown right there in, in the 36-inch balloon and uh, with helium. And uh, it made it all the way to Japan. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty typical. Some might make it. Most don't. Um, I found that in my, my findings are that if you want to send a balloon around the world, you're going to have to launch it 10 times. And within 10 times, you're going to make it once. So this was our first launch, single 36-inch Mylar. And um, we launched it. And uh, it... It made it all the way to Japan, and then it went down. Now, we get very serious about our balloon launches now. I mean, this is a, this is a big deal here. Uh, we made 14,000 miles in 14 days. We were doing really well, but then we hit a storm right off the coast of uh, uh, Japan, and I watched the altimeter. I watched it go down, you know, 30,000, 25, 24, 19. I watched it go down, so uh, it's kind of sad, but... Uh, you know, our commitment was we're going to keep going with our balloons there. We launched another uh, uh, set of smaller balloons, the party balloons, and this time it was two of those silver balloons taped together. And it made it to Poland, and uh, here's a Polish ham radio club that actually rescued it for us. It was up in the top of a tree about 100 feet in the air, and these guys in uh, Poland actually got it down for us, so they rescued it. We flew it from here to uh we should have put a letter or something in there, you know, airmail. So they uh, were uh, uh, nice enough to uh, recover it for us. This is, uh, this is our best flight we flew. This is uh, W5KUB-18. We launched number 23 today. This one went around the Earth three, three and a half times. It actually went down in the uh, Norwegian Sea uh, between uh, Greenland and Nor Nor uh, Norway. Uh, so, but this is one of the tracks uh, that you can follow the balloon on, and this is uh, um, this is an interesting path. In fact, if you look at that on our third lap, we were just about ready to complete our third lap, and it turned north, 20 miles from the finish line. For the third lap, it turns north and it heads up through the North Pole and up in the Arctic and and through Alaska, and then it came back and then it went on over. So uh, it, that added about a week to, we, we, we knew we were going to be celebrating the third lap tonight, but it took a week to get there. Uh, here's a typical launch uh, of our big balloon, the, uh, the, um, the SBS, 19, uh, SBS 13 balloon. That's what our tracker looked like. This one went around the world three and a half times. It was a solar panel, and if you look closely, those are drinking straws that are taped under it. So there were drinking straws taped under it. The little tractor was taped under it. Uh, Ed's fixing to let the uh, balloon go there. And uh, this is a very typical launch. And we fly this balloon all the time now uh, because it has the best chance of making it uh, around the world and, uh, and, and also staying up much longer. I think the record on this balloon, is, it's been able, one of these has been able to step 735 days. So Ed's fixing to let it go right there. Again, look at the bubble in the end. That's all the hydrogen that's in there, and we heat seal the bottom. And we always use hydrogen gas uh, to get more lift. We'll get 3,000 feet more lift with hydrogen gas than we get with helium gas. And if you use helium party gas, you're going to even get less. But uh, helium party gas is, is a good alternative. You can fly. So it just lets it go. Uh, we, it's it's going to head on up 17 feet beep. Feet below that, we got our tracker, and uh, it's going to be hanging right below it. And below that, it's the other half of the antenna. So there it is. It's uh, it's gone. Uh, so here, just to t 
tell you what you can do with this thing. For instance, uh, you're probably very familiar with the hurricane uh, models that you see on TV. The weather shows you these hurricane models. And they might show you 10 different models and they all kind of take the same way. Well, if you look at this picture here, that's exactly what this is. This is a NOAA prediction for our balloon. And if you see the red and the green and the blue there, those are prediction dots and timing where that balloon is going to be at, at the next 12 hours, 24 hours, 72 hours. And, and uh, I tell you, that balloon just about follows. It just about follows that pretty perfectly there. So it's a good indication. And that's on one of the websites. You were talking about websites and things tonight. That's one of the websites we use to track. And we'll talk a little about that in a few minutes. So, you know, if you latch on, will it make it around the Earth? You know, what will it take to make it around the Earth? And there's, you know, six or seven things that you got to have. First, you got to make it light. And then, I don't care how light you make it, you got to make it even lighter. Um, and then the winter months are the best chance to, to fly it, just because right now, all the storms are below the equator. Summertime, all those big storms move up above the equator, and balloons bring the, I mean, uh, storms bring these balloons down. Uh, even though we're flying, and the reason we're flying this balloon is to get that 44, 45,000 feet. Now, that's to get us over some storms. You know, some of these storms are easily, you know, 30,000 feet, cloud tops, 35, 40. So you want to try to fly over them. The smaller balloons that I mentioned earlier are going to fly so close down to the top of those storms that it's, they're going to get sucked down if they get a storm in the path. So we try to fly over the storm. So fly as high as we can. Launch in great weather. you got to have good weather. Um, these balloons, when this balloon takes off, the one we launched today, it had seven grams of lift. That's all. Seven grams of free lift. That's uh, just a couple pennies worth of lift. So, and we've done this before, and we learned the hard way. If you launch and it's cloudy up there, dark clouds, it gets up there, it gets moisture or some raindrops on it, and it's going to come down. It won't stay up at all. It, just a few raindrops. If Hey, I don't know if I can say this, but if a bird poops on it, it's going to come down. All right. So don't skip in design. And, and you got to think about mechanical strength. Make sure all that stuff will hold together up there. You're going to get into winds of, uh, you know, 150, 200 miles an hour. Now, it's not going to be like you're in a hurricane or something like that. The When, we, when we're flying at 150 miles an hour, uh, everything is pretty much... Um, uh, in relation to each other like it's not moving. I mean, the whole thing is moving at that speed. It's not just whipping around or anything like that. So, but you, you, you got to design where you don't want it coming apart. Uh, you you got to think about temperatures like minus 40 degrees Celsius. You know, temperatures will contract or expand solder joints. You want to make sure you don't have, you know, cold solder joints, bad solder joints. Uh, you know, don't don't leave wires hanging out where if they move back and forth, they're going to break off. You know, so don't skip in any of those things. you got to think about all those things. And then the last two important things are Mother Nature has to be on your side if this thing's going to make it around the world. And then the last thing is you have to have a miracle happen to get it around the world. So, so you know, our, our, uh, uh, our findings are one in ten balloons is going to make it around the world, and our number nine made it. Uh, number nine made it. Looking at the uh, uh, pr predictions there, here's some of the predictions. Sometimes we take a detour, and uh, the one at the top left there was out in the Pacific. And oh man, I thought we were never going to get out of the Pacific. That right there took about two weeks to get across the ocean just because we were going in circles out there. And then you can see the one at the top right there. That's the one where we went way up into the uh, Arctic Circle. It may look crude, but that was Dash 18. That's the one that went around the world three and a half times, and it stayed up 72 days. It's just a, that was a flexible solar panel. You can see the little drinking straws that I have uh, fastened to the bottom there. And if you look closely in the center, you see the tracker kind of sticking out the end there, taped on the bottom. And those are actually the antennas, the number 36 wire. There's the bottom half, 
uh, and there's the top half with the string uh, in it. And uh, the top half is attached to the string, string as we tie it to the balloon. So that's uh, that's what we uh, that's that was a very successful flight. We're trying to break that record right now. There we are uh, in the garage there, filling it with some hydrogen, and we have some weight scales, just like your typical drug user would use. We measure everything down to the gram. Um, in fact, this morning, we got about two grams too much hydrogen in our balloons, so we had to squeeze out about, we don't like doing that, but we had to squeeze out about two uh, grams of lift there. Uh, let's see. APR so whisper. How do we track this thing? Man, we got great tracking, let me tell you. There's two methods you can use. One is APRS, and you're probably familiar with APRS. It's very good. It gives you things like your altitude, your location, your speed. But it's limited to where there's APRS. And of course, in the United States, we have APRS about everywhere. In, in Europe, there's some APRS. But our problem was, which I didn't like, when we fly these balloons, most of, well, in they're going to cross the ocean. There is no APRS across the ocean. And if it takes you four days to get across the ocean, you don't know if it's flying or if it's come down. So, and, and then when you get to Africa, Africa, Middle East, top of India, there's really no APRS over there. Um, so, again, there's another 10 days that you might not even know if it's flying or where it is until it pops back up on the radar later. Whisper. You guys are probably familiar with Whisper. Um, it's uh, basically uh, uh, plots on a map, uh, you know, where you are. Basically, Whisper plots a four-digit grid square. So if you use just basic Whisper, it's going to say, okay, you're, you, this balloon is right in the center of a box, 200 miles by 300 miles. I mean, that's not great. But at least you know, is it over the ocean? Is it over Africa? So 200 by 300 miles. So that's not really good. We wanted to do better than that. So with a modified whisper transmission, by sending a second set of data, we can get things back like altitude, speed, location, voltage. And we get it down to a, 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 a six-digit grid square. We get it down to a box that's two miles by three. So that's pretty accurate. So uh, that's... Uh, uh, that's really good. Plus, plus whisper. I mean, your your APRS has got a range up there that high. Your it's got a range of a couple hundred miles. Whisper, our little ten milliwatt, ten milliwatt tracker, has a range of like nine thousand miles. Nine thousand. So, I don't care if you're over Africa or India or ocean. We're gonna know where it is. So uh, that's the reason we use this modified whisper. And uh, I'll talk a little more about that. Here we go. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a whisper map. You can see our there's our tracker right in the center over the ocean, and it says, "Hey, we're over the ocean." So if you just drew you a little 200 mile by 300 mile box, that's where we are right there. But you can see we had plenty of people picking it up, and reporting it in in Europe and also in the United States. So that that's good. That's good. Here's how we get that all that extra data that we do. So you take uh, you take the balloon and we take Whisper and we transmit a second set of call letters. The first set we we send is called W5KUB and it it sends a grid square. Echo Mike 55, a four-digit grid square. So so that sends it, it goes into uh, a receiver on the ground, they put it into uh, the Whisper database, and anybody can look it up and know that I'm within Echo Mike 55. Now, with this modified Whisper transmission, we send a second call letters, which starts with something like a 1 or a Q, and the one we're flying right now is a Q7. There is no country in the world that has a Q7 call, so we send a different data string, like QX7XXX, uh, down to Whisper, and it goes in the database. And what those X's are, you know, the QX7, that, that first X, that's the number of satellites. And then uh, QX7XXX, the first X might be voltage. And then the second two uh, X's would be 
they would be the uh, the fourth. I mean, it'd be the fifth and sixth uh, indicator of your grid square, which would give you echo mic five five plus dB. So you get six. Uh, you put it together, you get six uh, digit grid square, and you now you're down to a two mile square. So so the balloon transmits these two transmissions. It's picked up by Whisper. Whisper then sends it to the internet. They send it to the Whisper database. And then on the ground, we have a computer running with a Python script. And it pulls that information from the database. It pulls it in and says, okay, I got a QA7ABC. Well, that A, that, that's 12 satellites. And then that uh, B is uh, 3.7 volts. The C is uh, uh, D. And, the, and then the next letter is B, like DB, or your, your six-digit grid square. So then it takes that information from a spreadsheet and it matches it matches those letters to a spreadsheet in a database and then it sends it to APRS then we send it to APRS and then it's just like you were on APRS you could you could pull up your call on APRS and you're going to see altitude uh, speed course uh, voltage all those things so that's kind of a trick we do to uh, to get that extra data, and it is really sharp. And this balloon just don't go anywhere. That you you'll know where it is it, every every ten minutes. We get a report where this balloon is. Some great web websites to help you predict your flight is is windy.com and Ventuski. And I want to show you a couple of these. Uh, you know, with our GPS and our uh, trackers, we know we know exactly where we are. And we know um, our altitude. So um, if we know all that, let me see if I can go to, I'm going to go to Ventuski here. Um, I'll go to Wendy. Here's Wendy right now. So this is our website. It's called Wendy.com. Now, we know our exact position, and we know our altitude. So if you look at this over here on the, uh, over here on the right side, you set the altitude. So I'll set the altitude there at, say, 42,000 feet. And then we know our position is here. And look, our position right here says right now you should be moving at 97 miles per hour. So that's part of a jet stream. So if we move that around right there, there's, there's 100 miles an hour right there. As long as we're traveling right through there, 100 miles an hour. When we hit the blue, we're going to slow down. There's 80, 60, 40. And then we're going to come on across here, and we're going to hit back up to 100 miles an hour. So that's kind of... Uh, a great website that will help you. That's called uh, Ventuski. It will also show you storms. If I click on, um, if I click on thunderstorms. Let's see. Okay, if I click on thunderstorms, if you look at this, you'll see that most all the storms right now are, are south of the equator. Uh, north of the equator is uh, pretty clear right there. And then there's another one called Ventuski. Ventuski, look at this. Ventuski is really neat, man. You know right where we are. Right now, our balloon is somewhere over South Carolina. It's nighttime, and we don't know exactly where it is. But we're right in here. And look at that, 135 miles an hour right now. And, and this is the direction we're going right here. We're going to follow the air here. And um, we're going to follow the air. And uh, we can see exactly where it's going to go. We, we generally always cross at the Straits of Gibraltar. We always go through right there below Spain at the Straits of Gibraltar. We'll go across Libya and, and, uh, uh, and then across the Middle East here. We'll hit Iraq, uh, Iran. Uh, and then we get into the stands, the Kirk, Kirkistan and places like that over here. This is uh, kind of a tough area here to uh, receive from, but... You can also tune in with SDR receivers, you know, like Kiwi receivers. You can uh, take your computer and go online to a Kiwi receiver, say, in Russia. And you can listen for it, and you can, you can hear it and collect the data and put it into the database. Uh, so uh, that's kind of cool, the way we can, we can see where it is. Those are helpful, helpful things. Um, so, and it also shows cloud tops. Uh, for instance, here, uh, I just, here's a still picture. Um, right there, the cloud tops were 41,800 feet. And we're flying at about 42,000, so it's getting pretty close there. Um, again, that, that's the speed. I just showed you a minute ago the speed. 
Uh, we crashed in a Norwegian Sea on uh, Flight 18. Uh, that was the spinal resting place right there. Now, I'm going to talk about ants. You know, I mentioned astronauts and ants. You know, somebody asked, asked us, how do we steer the balloon? Steer it. Well, you, you really don't steer it. But we said, um, we said, well, we've got some highly trained ants. We, we put them through a year of training to steer this thing. And it kind of took on. And everybody started talking about the ants. And uh, 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 if you go on our Facebook page right now and follow the flights, they're asking about the ants and where they are. And uh, they're wishing them good luck and, uh, and on and on and on. Um, we give out, even give out certificates there for uh, people that uh, uh, follow the flight, uh, copy the flight, uh, pick it up on Whisper. Uh, we we uh, send out certificates. Uh, uh, and these guys, these ants, were actually awarded different medals when they crossed the International Dateline. They got a medal when they, you know, uh, various different things. So that's kind of cool right there. We've had 13 flights this year, no casualties. We have a great first class rescue team. This picture was made of our crew on flight 18 uh, when they went down in the Norwegian Sea. Uh, but there they are there with a telephoto camera when the plane went by. You can see uh, all three crew members are doing okay there. The last flight we hit, it crashed in China. We didn't know how we were going to get the, the uh, ants out, but they were rescued there by uh, Tibetan monks there. They rescued uh, the crew of Flight 22. Here's some of your options Options here to, uh, if you're interested in doing this, uh, you can use hydrogen gas. Uh, there's some risk to that. It's cheaper than helium. Uh, or you can use helium gas. Not hardly any risk to that, and typically most schools and places like that uh, use the helium gas uh, just to avoid any risk. Helium is uh, a lot more expensive. Helium is a rare uh, gas. Uh, you know, hydrogen is a gas that can be um, not recycled, but, but but made. You know, by by various different processes. Uh, hydrogen is plentiful. Whereas helium is not plentiful, it's kind of a rare uh, gas. It comes out of the ground at uh, some of the natural gas places, and it's caused by uh, uh, radioactive uh, uh, material near the gas, and that produces the, uh, the helium. Now, helium is used in a lot of medical uh, devices, and that's where most of it goes. So it, it's, it's more expensive. We use hydrogen all the time. It gives us about 3,000 feet more lift. In our particular balloon, uh, we can fly that balloon at 45,000 feet with, with uh, hydrogen. If we put the helium in that, we would only fly at about 42,000 or something like that. 42, 43,000 feet, maybe. Um, and you can't put more gas in to go higher. It just it doesn't work that way. Uh, okay, so... You, you can uh, do, do, you know, for the tracker, what are you going to do for the tracker? A home-built tracker, uh, it's, it's difficult. You saw the size of those parts. Uh, it's, it's cheaper to build, but you really got to gear up. I mean, you need to buy a microscope. You need to buy special tools for soldering and, uh, and for uh, holding the parts and so forth. Uh, the pre-built trackers, they're ready to, ready to go. Uh, that's the way I would suggest people that are getting started, you know, do that. You can fly the expensive balloons like what we're flying, $180 balloons. I see SBS 13 balloons. Or you can fly some of the inexpensive $4 balloons. Now, these $4 balloons typically might last a week. Uh, there's, there's one of them right now that has, made, that has gone around the world nine times and that's a $4 balloon. It's gone around nine times, so I won't say they, they can't do it. And even the big expensive balloon that I'm talking about here, uh, I've seen them not last more than one or two days. So, you know, it's uh, Mother Nature for sure. So hydrogen takes you higher. It's a little dangerous. We still have all of our eyebrows and all of our fingers after all this. Uh, we, we haven't had uh, any, any problems with it at all. But if you want to use hydrogen, that's, that's probably something there you might want to think about getting. Uh, get you one of those suits right there.
Okay, on this flight, we added some uh, new things to this flight, um, this launch today. Uh, we added a CWID, and it can actually be heard if you tune down to 14092. You can hear it, and we had people uh, today after launch even copying it up in uh, Canada. And it's just a CWID. It's about 10 words a minute. You'll hear it. It transmits once, and it transmits on the minute every one minute, 11 minutes, 21 minutes, 31, 41, and 51. That's when it transmits. We also added a QRSS mode. QRSS, uh, if you're a CW operator, you know QRS stands for go slow. Well, <clears throat> QRSS is very slow, and um, it is, uh, that, that is transmitted at about one, about one word a minute, but that's because there's a program out there that, uh, and I forget the name of the program, Alpo or Al something like that. I can get it for you guys. But it has a waterfall, and it will actually, and I'm, I'll I got a video here to show you what it does. It actually will, will copy that QRSS, that slow CW, and it will actually put the dots and the dashes on the waterfall, and you'll be able to see uh, the, the, the call sign in the waterfall. We were going to run a 100 milliwatt amplifier on this flight. We're only running 10 milliwatts. Again, 10 milliwatts is getting us 9,000 miles, but we were going to try to run 100 milliwatts. I wanted to try something different. I spent about two weeks pulling my hair out trying to get a 100 milliwatt amplifier working, and I'm having a lot of difficulty with it because we actually have a lot of voltage variations. We go from 3.8 volts down to 2.9 volts, and, you know, a lot of things going on there, and also the impedance matching of the antenna and so forth. So uh, I've decided to put that off. So we are flying the CWID in the QRSS mode. Uh, I've got a tracking site on my website, w5kub.com. If you'll just go to balloon at the upper menu, balloon, and click on it, it'll bring you up to our tracking site, and uh, you'll... Uh, You'll see some pictures. Oop, let's see. Oop, that's not, you'll see pictures and uh, uh, maybe of the launch, of, of building the thing. There's three buttons there you can click on that will take you to easy tracking. If you click on APRS button or the Hab Hub button or the Whisper button, it'll it'll take you right to tracking right there. It tells you how long we've been up in the air and so forth. So that's at w5kb.com. Click on balloon and uh, there there we go. Now. Uh, here we go. We're getting close to the end of our talk on on this, but this is this is um this is ants again. But we have a lot of interaction with the guys up here. All right, so. I, I do want to thank uh, Edward, Y03 uh, ICT, uh, for encouraging me to build that little bitty tracker. He really helped me. And, of course, Bill Brown is the the master of high-altitude balloons. Bill's been launching uh, balloons for, you know, 30 years and has probably made a, a, a thousand launches. And uh, he's been the one uh, behind the uh, Python script and uh, the firmware and so forth. Here is the, um, here's the QRS, uh, QRSS. Let's see if I can make this play here. You can hear here, Bill tuned in today, the CWID, and he copied the QRSS. All right, you watch this right here. Let's see, i got to turn it up. i got to give you some... If you watch this... This is, this is Argo, A-R-G-O, it's free software. This will actually copy that one word per minute CW that we're transmitting, and it will put in a visual form. Look at this. If you look at coming across the screen, you see a W there, the da da. And then you see the five, did it, did it, did And then the, the K-U-B, how you like it? It's actually decoding that, and it's actually putting it on a screen. That's called Argo. And uh, that is, uh, that's kind of a neat little program that, uh, again, it will decode stuff just like uh, Whisper does. All right. 
so that was pretty much uh, what I wanted to talk to you about on uh, about the the balloons, uh, the Pico balloons. Uh, I, I do want to mention to you just very quickly about our our show and invite you guys to be a part of it and um, and uh, because our show does these type. Uh, projects and this project is an ongoing one for the show so I'm gonna let you see um, right here this is this is kind of an introductory or a promo I just want to show it to you real quick I just want to give you a, uh, a, a just a quick promo there of our, our show, and you may have recognized. Uh, I don't know if you saw Tim Allen. He uh, a short appearance there. We've taken our show out to Hollywood, and uh, I met Tim Allen. We got to break the news on our show that Tim got his license. Um, we've um, we've got Raleigh Hollinsworth from the uh, retired from the FCC, uh, you know, as a co-host, and Katie, and uh, it's probably one of the fastest growing ham shows out there. Um, we uh, would like to invite all you guys to uh, to it. It's on a Tuesday night at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Just go to W5KUB on uh, YouTube. Just go to YouTube and key in W5KUB. Or, or you can go to my website, W5KUB.com, and you can click on uh, live video and chat. And, um, you know, right now we're giving away an HF antenna to somebody every week uh, for the next eight weeks. Um, our show has been going now for about uh, a little over six and a half years. Well, almost seven years now, actually. Um, uh, and for 18 years, uh, we webcasted major events like Ham Hamvention, and we would actually do a 50-hour marathon stream. And we would give away about ten thousand dollars in prizes to people watching that couldn't, you know, come to Hamfest. And uh, so we got a big following. We've been watched in 150 countries. Um, our show also is broadcast uh, on on uh, Thursday afternoons on uh, famous international shortwave station WBCQ on 7490. Our entire show is repeated on that shortwave. Uh, we are uh, we're on a po we have an audio podcast. If you're driving across country and you want to download it, uh, we've got nearly every podcast carrier out there, from iTunes to to uh, you know any, any of these guys, Google Play, any of these guys. Uh, uh, you can get our podcast, and um, we've got phone lines in about 65 countries. People from, typically from Australia call into the show at night. So uh, we just like to uh, invite you to the show and also let me just uh, one more thing uh, our Facebook group we have a ham radio Facebook group that has over 11,000 hams in it 
and just on Facebook, just search for W5KUB, and that's it. It's actually an amateur radio roundtable, but you can search for W5KUB, and, and uh, we'd love to have you join us there. It follows the show. It follows all of our balloon launches and all the different projects and, and things that uh, we've got going on. So uh, I hope I didn't take too long. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I, I'm just so thankful, and uh, thank you so much for asking me to come tonight. Hey guys, we'd love to have you subscribe to our channel. Please hit the subscribe button and also hit the like if you like the video. And uh, also please join our Facebook group. It's at uh, just Facebook to search for W5KUB. That's W5Kilo Uniform Bravo. Got a lot of great things going. Thanks.